Ordnance Survey Triangulation Station. You can imagine the whole plaza full of people. Hello, how do you do? And welcome to A Thing of the Past. Today, we're going on a tour of some of Leicestershire's war memorials from Colville to Mount Sorrel. Through this journey, we hope to show how the sheer scale of loss during the First World War meant that monuments went from highlighting the actions of an individual, such as the 700 monuments still standing to Lord Nelson today in Britain and across her former dominions and empires, to the names of every man from 16,000 villages and towns being listed on monuments across the land. We also hope to show how the individuality of each monument reflects the land that the man left behind, the land that was a part of them. We hope you enjoy this episode. We start our journey today here, close to the site of the former Colville Midland Railway Station on the Leicester to Burton line. It was here on October the 30th, 1914, that the famous 50 or first 50 said their final farewells and boarded the train to take them to Luton for training and then onto the front line in France. Over the course of the war, 355 men from the Colville district would lose their lives and many more returned with wounds, mental and physical. Although not the actual wall, by 1919, a stone tablet had been placed in the boundary wall of the station to commemorate those who had lost their lives. However, it was decided that this wasn't enough and a committee was formed that would eventually lead to the building of the clock tower. Although grand and beautiful structures, does this suffice for the loss felt by the families of the men who went away? I often think of my great grandmother pushing my granddad in his pushchair, not yet three years old, after her husband was killed at Anzio. Looking up at that clock tower, did that really make up for the great loss that they both felt and would feel for the rest of their lives? The placement of the clock tower in what is now Memorial Square was a powerful statement in itself. This is where the four districts of Whittick, Swannington, Ravenstone, and Hugglescote met before Colville existed, and therefore represents the men who came from the wider area, not just that of Colville Town. On the tower and surrounding plimps is not only my great granddad, but also my great uncles, William Barney and Walter Hill. The first meeting of the Colville War Memorial Committee was held on the 12th of July 1920. The committee succeeded the Welcome Home Committee and inherited £375 from that committee. At the first and second meetings, discussion of an informal character took place as to the form the memorial should take. Some committee members favoured a utility scheme, while other members suggested a recreation ground, a baths or a cottage hospital. Mr Stanley, the chairman of the group, said that he would not like the deaths of those men to be used for something that the council could provide. After a few more meetings, it was decided that the memorial would take the form of the clock tower. McCarthy, Collins and company were chosen to design the tower. By 1920, they had already designed a cinema and a hosiery factory in Whittick. And after the tower had been raised, they would go on to design the TB isolation hospital in Hinckley and the sanatorium in Markfield. The total cost of a tower came to 2,250 pounds. Today, that's around 130,000 pounds. There were donations from Stableford's railway carriage makers and South Leicestershire Colliery. The clock tower was officially opened on October the 31st, 1925. Charles Booth's widow, Mary, opened the ceremony and over 10,000 people attended. You can imagine the whole plaza full of people all showing their respects to the 355 who died. In 1925, Armistice Day fell on a Wednesday the Colville Times reported that there was no official arrangements to celebrate. However, a touching scene was witnessed in the Memorial Square. 
When the buzzer at Stableford's Wagon Works gave one long blast at the 11th hour, a crowd around the memorial stood reverently for two minutes. This two minute silence at the monument is still observed today. So we're now parked up at the Wittick end of Swanymote Road. To the east of me there is Mount St. Bernard's Abbey. We're gonna head in the opposite direction into Cademan's Woods towards Temple Hill, where we'll be able to find the remains of a monument that was to an individual who died during the Indian Mutiny way before the First or the Second World War. So we've reached the highest point close to Swanymote Road the Ordnance Survey Triangulation Station. Now, from this point, we're not too sure where the monument actually is. We know it's off that way, so it's going to be a bit of an adventure. Much of Cademan Wood was purchased by Sir Ambrose Phillips in 1690, whose main family residence was Garandon Hall, near Loughborough. His grandson, Everard Lyle Phillips, born on the 28th of May 1835 at Grace Dew Manor, was the second son of Charles Phillips and Laura Clifford. Everard initially attended the UK's oldest Catholic school, St Edmunds at Ware in Hertfordshire. Destined to be an officer in the East India Company, Everard then moved to Paris to join his older brother and to learn Hindustani, this being a requirement to join the East India Company at the time. Meanwhile, the brothers became well known in Paris, attending parties given by Emperor Napoleon III and Empress Eugenie. Everard successfully passed the East India Company's officer entrance examination and family influence helped purchase Everard a commission as an ensign with the company in India. Everard left England for India in October 1854, aged 19. His mother wrote at the time, Dear Everard bore the parting from us with great courage, though he seemed a good deal affected. This would be the last time she would see her son. After an hour or so of aimlessly wandering around the woods looking suspicious, we came to the conclusion we weren't going to find the monument by ourselves. We asked a few dog walkers and then finally found someone who had heard of it and was happy to show us the way. So after a long, long search and with some help from a man, we have finally found the hill that the monument once stood on. Up here was a 40 foot tower, the Hunting Lodge, and it was built for Everard Lyle March Phillips VC, who was killed in the Indian Mutiny in 1857. The tower itself was built between 1863 and 1864, and it was actually designed the same shape as a water bastion that March Phillips captured during the Indian Mutiny. We can tell that the tower was once up here, as we have found red bricks amongst other stones that were obviously used in the construction. So we're now here, up on top of the hill, where the monument once stood. I've actually been reading about this monument for quite a few years, and it's quite euphoric to actually be where it stood. Also, the size of the hill compared to the height of the monument at 40 feet is quite a shock. I was looking for a much bigger hill, much more diameter. Now, the monument itself was erected in memory of Lieutenant Everard Phillips, who eventually won the VC during the Indian Mutiny. He began the mutiny as part of the 11th Bengal Native Infantry of the East India Company. When the regiment mutinied, several days of anarchy ensued, with Phillips describing how mothers and children were butchered. It is said that when Queen Victoria's proclamation against the insurgents came, he had to read it out as he could speak the native tongue. Riding boldly forward while the bullets whistled round him, he began to read the proclamation, but his horse was shot from under him and he fell to the ground, himself wounded by a stray bullet. Undeterred, he sprang to his feet and read the whole proclamation from beginning to end before taking cover. With the 11th Bengal Native Infantry practically dissolved, he received a commission to join the 60th Rifles in the regular British Army, and they marched on Delhi. At the assault of a city, he captured a water bastion with seven riflemen, and a day later, on the 18th of September 1857, was killed in the streets of Delhi. It is unclear exactly where Everard was when he was shot and killed, but it is said that he was building a protective breastwork with his men, and on looking through a peephole to observe the enemy, received a shot in the eye, 
killing him instantly. Interestingly, at the time, it was impossible to receive the VC if you were killed during the conflict it was recommended for, but when the conditions were changed 50 years later, he was awarded the medal posthumously. Now to us today, it might seem quite grim to build a building that reminds you of where your son died, but at the time, the construction of such a huge monument echoed the triumph that the son was part of in capturing that bastion. A similar thing that I saw in the north when they were building the Bramhope Tunnel was that many navvies who got killed there were commemorated in the reconstruction of the north entrance to the tunnel in Otley's graveyard. The monument that once stood here was designed by E.W. Pugin. He was the son of Augustus Pugin, who designed the interior of the Houses of Parliament. E.W. Pugin did a lot of work around this area. He made the octagonal chapel that is now at St. Bernard's Abbey. He did a lot of construction on Garandon Hall, and he also converted the Temple of Venus for the visit of a cardinal. A bit more on that later. You might be wondering what a monument to someone who died in the Indian Mutiny has to do with these other monuments that we're looking at today that all commemorate men who died in the First or Second World War. What we're trying to show by visiting this monument is from the Napoleonic War, when a lot of columns and monuments were constructed to Nelson, that this, then, this stage of a national hero then started to be taken down on a smaller scale. So here we have a man who wasn't celebrated nationally, but in terms of his family and the local people, they raised the money together to make this monument. And then obviously with the other monuments, we then see that this is a huge effort in terms of everybody who was affected by those wars. On our way to the next monument, we stopped by the previously mentioned Temple of Venus, which was commissioned by Everard's grandfather, Ambrose Phillips of Garandon, in the 1830s. E.W. Pugin worked on the conversion of the temple into a chapel for a visit by Cardinal Manning in the 1870s. The interior originally contained a statue of Venus, which is now lost. It was perhaps destroyed by Luddite rioters in 1811, who were violently opposed to technological change and the riots were put down to the introduction of new machinery in the wool industry. In Garandon Park, where the Temple of Venus stands, there is a legend that surrounds the large pool at the northern end of the park. It is said that for four days during the Civil War, the water became deeper and deeper red. Cattle refused to drink and great clots that had the appearance of blood rose and fell in the water. Local people decided that the four days of blood must represent the four years of civil war and named the pool the Bloody Pool thereafter. So we're now here at Queen's Park in Loughborough to look at our next memorial, the Loughborough Carillion. The town of Loughborough at this time had a population of around 20,000 people and they managed to raise £21,000 to build the memorial. To put that in perspective, the city of Leeds at this time had a population of half a million people and they only managed to raise £6,000, so three times as less as the town of Loughborough. The Carillion is actually a musical instrument housed within the tower. It works like an organ, but plays bells instead of the pipes, so it is a combination of bell ringing with an organ setup. Edward Elgar wrote memorial chimes for the inauguration of the Carillion, which took place in July 1923. Interestingly, Elgar wrote the piece in collaboration with William Wooding Starmer and Belgian Carillionaire Jeff Denin. Elgar adapted his piece to the niceties and limitations of the particular instrument, but being unsatisfied with the result, he soon rearranged it for organ. The people of Loughborough chose the Carillion due to the town's affinity with bells. John Taylor's and Sons made the bells for St Paul's. And also, the Carillion is a popular instrument in the Low Countries, Belgium, Holland, where so many of the men remembered here lost their lives. We spoke to one of the volunteers at the Carillion. 
He told us that the tower is home to the Loughborough Carillion and War Memorial Museum, and throughout the year they hold regular Carillion recitals. The 17th to the 20th of July is known as Loughborough Carillion Week. During this week, there are daily recitals by guest Carillion heirs. Check the description for a link to the website. He also explained to us about the blue copper from the top of the tower running down the building and across the plaza due to the rain, which speaks to the uniqueness of this incredible monument. As previously mentioned, the 47 bells contained in the tower were cast at the John Taylor Bell Foundry, the last major bell foundry in Britain. The cost of the bells totaled £7,000, towards which the Taylor Bell Foundry donated £2,000. The largest of the bells is inscribed in proud loving memory of his three nephews, killed in action in France, John William Taylor, Gerard Bardsley Taylor and Arnold Bradley Taylor. Other donations towards the cost were received from Queen Alexandra and Winston Churchill, as well as local organisations such as Brush, Loughborough Grammar School and the Church Lads Brigade. We are now on our way south to the nearby village of Mount Sorrel to see our final monument of the day. We're now on top of Castle Hill overlooking Mount Sorrel with the war memorial built in 1926 to the 73 men who lost their lives in the First World War. The memorial here is made of red granite from the local quarry. In the construction of the monuments in Anstey, Rofley and Woodhouse Eaves, grey granite from the quarry was used. But here, the special red granite was used. The monument was designed by a local architect, Shirley Harrison, who also designed De Montfort Hall and the Usher Hall in Edinburgh. To get the granite up on top of the hill, they installed a narrow gauge railway, but without the locomotive, so they used pushes and pulleys to bring the granite up to the top here and erect it above Mount Sorrel Village. Proving that size doesn't always matter, what's really striking about this monument is its prominence above the village on the hill. Unlike the other memorials we've looked at at the clock tower in Colville and the Carillion in Loughborough, Mount Sorrel Granite Company completely covered the cost of erecting this memorial. Stonemasons from the quarry crafted it and they paid for the narrow gauge railway to bring it up onto the hill. When looking at today's final monument, it's important to note the location of it. Being placed on the top of the hill like it is suggests the religious and almost Calvary-like iconography reflecting the ultimate sacrifice made by the men of the village. Each monument we have seen today is an everlasting reminder that regardless of religion, politics, race or class, the men listed on these tablets gave their everything and that should be respected and remembered. For many generations to come, these memorials should not just be seen as a thing of the past.